compadre fritillary, or fritillary, depending on who you're talking to, um, and how it will be threatened by climate change, possibly. Um, and like I said, Andres is not here, but he has part of the presentation. General outline. First, we're going to talk about the biological background of this species, and then the habitat background, which is very important, and the research questions. Yeah, so as we explore the research questions, we'll talk about um, the interview, um, the really nice interview that we all got to conduct with Kevin Alexander um, here. Um, and then we kind of explore the impacts of climate change um, on threatened species. Um, and we dealt with a little bit of research there. And then, and then current adaptation measures and what we think we could really do to push it a little further, along with some next steps. Uh, that they could take in both mitigation and adaptation, um, and some lessons that we could kind of learn in general about conserving a species slash conserving a biome. Um, if time permits, we would hope to get into discussion about um, some of these recommendations. So big surprise, I'm going to talk about ecology. And so this species has been listed as vulnerable, which is that one. Um, and it's butterfly. Didn't help. Um, it's endemic to the San Juan Mountains. There's only 11 populations that are distinct. There could be another population that someone hasn't found, but 11 detected distinct micro populations. Um, and it was discovered on top of Mount Compadre in Colorado, which is kind of cool. It was discovered on top of the mountain. Um, and it is the only insect that was assessed in the Gunnison Basin Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment, which was discussed in the Gunnison Stage Grass Restoration Project. Uh, that also collaborates in 2011 with the Nature Conservancy Natural Heritage Program and the Southwest Climate Change Initiative, which is a landscape-based climate change project. Um, and it being the only insect assessed by the project raises some questions, I think. As most people know, insects are a pretty integral part to an ecosystem. Uh, they're pretty hard to detect. It's supposed to like pica or marmot or some larger species back for the creation get a little bit more attention to nature. Um, a little bit about their habitat and food sources. So they're pretty small. Um, because they're at high elevations, they don't really move much. They move like maybe 50 meters in their lives. Um, male and female are a little bit different. And they have the smallest range of any butterfly in North America, or amongst the smaller ranges. Um, so that are very specific. And because they're so sedentary too, you can imagine that that will cause some problems as far as we talk about uh, migration and being able to adapt. Um, and their two year life cycle and uneven years means that they will have a brood every other year. Which is interesting from an ecological standpoint because if you're trying to detect changes in a population, it kind of throws a wrench in the works. Like one effect from one year that might be a little drier or there might be a change in air quality or something that would affect the butterfly might not actually affect them. And then as far as habitat, they consume this willow primarily, but they are kind of opportunistic nectars, which means it will basically be any flower. There's a type of potentilla, I don't really know what the common name for that would be, but there's also flocks up at high elevations and they're they've known to consume both of those. But they are pretty open tied to this willow species, which means if they're sedentary and they're tied to this species, they don't really move that far away from these patches. Um, and so if you think about the way that a patch of this willow might end up moving up the mountain or changing, and think about the way that the butterflies have to follow that, it would cause some problems as far as their ecology and their ability to survive. All right, so like I said, we had the chance to talk to Kevin Alexander um, and talk a little bit about his research. Um, if we imagine a timeline, there was um, 19, in the 1980s, they um, found the population on top of a compography. Um, and they realized that there were, um, um, there were other metapopulations um, that were uh, being ex extirpated. And so they start conducting um, extensive research, research in 94. Kevin then built upon that um, with his team, um, Catherine Bernier, um, Andrew Kevin. Um, they 
got the crew, um, summer crew, together as well as partnerships. Um, they got into partnerships with um, the land management agencies, um, and they begin to conduct a population assessment. Um, um, and they're really looking at three questions. These three questions were, um, do uncompodra fertility sites um, exhibit a higher floral diversity um, and abundance than their proximate sites? And, and this is, these are sites that are roughly two meters away from um, a, ha a population. Um, is floral diversity a limiting factor in butterfly habitat? Um, and are there changes in their habitat since the initial um, we'll, we'll call it the secondary research in 1994. Um, so what happened in 1994, um, Hugh Britton um, and Lynn Riley, the researchers, um, examined five replicates um, and they determined that higher floral diversity in occupied sites, uh, oh, they determined that there was higher floral um, diversity in occupied sites. They determined a greater number of nectar sources um, in these occupied sites um, and a higher number of flowers per um, meter in the occupied sites. So again, the 2010 research um, with Alexander's team goes back um, and really um, digs deeper. Um, what we see is that they study 12 replicates um, with paired occupied and unoccupied sites uh, to look at diversity and abundance as well as dominance and evenness. Um, they use the same methods, which I a little bit, um, but the 2010 study finds that the average number of flowers per the half meter plot um, is actually less um, than in unoccupied sites. So occupied sites have less, um, have a fewer number of flowers, um, but their methodology um, identifies that there are more flowers per meter um, if you're doing a line transect um, per, uh, in the occupied site than in the unoccupied sites. So floral abundance is less um, but there are more flowers in the line transept. What does that mean? Well, that's a good question. Um, ultimately, they, they do come to the conclusion that there's high, higher, higher observed biodiversity um, in the occupied sites based on that. Um, but 2010 research leaves us with big questions uh, about the impacts of snowpack um, on floral presence um, in the abundance um, the following year, um, the following summer, um, as well as the impacts of big snow years um, on butterfly populations. Um, Bernie Keck and Alexander um, then asked what is the nature of the relationship between uh, butterfly populations um, and changes in floral sources? Um, and then finally, what is the impact um, of um, this? They begin to just explore this. Um, of domestic grazing um, on floral abundance in unoccupied and occupied sites. Um, we're gonna, that was the research. Let's shift to the discussion on global climate change. So, you know, we've gone through this all semester, but global climate change is a global phenomenon um, and its impact. <laughs> its impacts vary from place to place. Um, scientists use observed climate data to um, model climate simulations at multiple scales, um, from global to regional to local. Um, and so what they're doing is they're hoping to measure the impacts of observed changes to assess potential threats um, to species and ecosystems in the future. Um, one of the main activities um, that climate science looks at, um, or has been looking at in the past 30, 30 years, is to ask whether or not the observed trends are out of the ordinary. Um, observations are based on, of course, direct measurements um, and remote sensing. And we've done a lot of paleoclimate um, modeling to really get um, a good picture to observe these trends. What is the trend? Um, the normal warming of our climate system is unequivocal. Um, since the 1950s, um, globally, the temperature has risen um, 0.85 degrees centigrade. Uh, when we begin to think about climate change, um, of course we must think about vulnerability um, and sensitivity. Um, vulnerability, we know, is defined as um, the degree to which a system or species is susceptible or unable to cope with adverse effects of climate change, um, including the extremes. 
Um, sensitivity is the degree to which a system or species um, is affected adversely or um, beneficially um, by the variability. So, climate change is affected or is predicted to significantly affect the frequency and severity of disturbances, um, and it's predicted to have an impact on ecosystems and species, um, in land use, and as well as invasives. Um, of course, climate change can be characterized by the changes in seasonal and annual precip, um, and of course, the frequency of events, extreme events. So here we um, go back to the basin climate change um, assessment. Um, and so of course we know that this report summarizes the results of landscape scale climate change vulnerability um, on the upper Gunnison Basin. Um, and of course it focuses on ecosystems and species of concern. Um, the report also summarizes the results of social vulnerability, which we don't talk about much here. Um, but it is important to note that the only insect on, um, that was studied in the assessment was the uncompounded fritillary. Um, and so, and it, oh, and it's also of the highest vulnerability. Um, what we're looking at here is the vulnerability rankings of the ecosystems. Um, this is really just defining the proportion of the ecosystem at risk, of, um, at risk of being eliminated by the year 2050. Um, so there's the fritillary, um, and it is of the second highest vulnerability. Do you have anything to add to that? Um, I mean, not so much. It's saying that a lot that they have a niche, and uh, it's, they're very specific to that, and any change in that would be a major change to their life. So unlike a bighorn sheep or a pika might be able to move and survive and uh, raise young, their ability to uh, reproduce and in like a low stress environment is very much impacted by changes in their ecosystem. All right, so let's we'll look at temperature variation impacts on this ecosystem, um, this region as a whole. We uh, are aware that climate change is changing ecosystems and affecting um, people in southwestern United States. Um, rising temperatures have contributed to large-scale um, ecological impacts. Um, they're affecting plants and animals, as well as ecosystem services, aka water supply. Um, the climate of the Gunnison Basin, though, is projected to get warmer uh, um, over the next few decades um, as part of a larger warming pattern. Um, the average annual temperature of the Gunnison Basin is projected to increase by 3 degrees centigrade um, by 2015. Average temperatures are expected to increase by 4 degrees centigrade. Um, here in this chart, we look at a snow tail site um, weather station, and what we're seeing um, is that the average um, temperature in Gunnison County um, has increased from um, mid century folks in mid-century um, to now substantially. We're looking at a 2 degree um, Fahrenheit increase. Um, one concern for when we're looking at temperature is that this shift, um, this will shift the Uncompagra fertilizer life cycle and will compact it um, into a one-year cycle as opposed to its biannual cycle. Um, this can have, of course, multiple cascading effects, species, um, this species may lack the adaptability um, will have, and could have a reduced fitness, increased mortality, and of course it will reduce the fitness of the whole food web um, when, of course, resources can be found. Warmer temperatures can result in more generations of multiple group species, um, and this will affect egg laying periods and other live traits determined by photo period, which we don't fully understand. Um, finally, um, as climate change, as te um, cl temperatures increase, um, biomes will shift. And where do you shift an alpine biome? You can't go any higher. Um, you push it off the mountain. And so it's a big risk. <coughs> that was <laughs> And then we'll look at the hydrological impacts of climate 
change. Um, just a kind of brief summary, climate-driven hydrology in mountains um, is determined to a large extent by the topographic relief of mountains. Um, mountain belts produce regional scale concentration of precipitation on upwind slopes. Um, the rain shadow effect in the lee of mountains on upwind slopes, uh, or sorry, on the, on the upwind slope, and um, we also have deep mountain, um, deep intermontane valley systems, which creates um, high mountain deserts. Um, so, of course, high mountain chains like ours uh, intercept a lot of atmospheric moisture um, and produce intense precipitation. Um, climate change will affect the total moisture, total moisture flux um, and, the, and the temporal scale upon which they um, Climate, of course, has been highly variable in the Gunnison Basin historically. Um, what they are predicting is a shift um, in the timing of precipitation from spring to summer. Uh, uh, from spring and the summer, we're predicting that into the winter. Um, but we're also producing um, an earlier onset of spring, which will increase, or that will um, we'll have earlier runoff. Um, and what you're going to see as well is that because of warming temperatures, we're going to have more rain than snow, um, and which increases the risk of seasonal flooding. Um, there's also predictions of drought um, because um, as it's just as an extreme event. Um, there are relatively small amounts of warming though observed in, in the valley or in the basin, so um, the, high, the effect on the hydrological cycle has not been um, strongly affected. Um, but the takeaway from this is that um, the fertile area is sensitive to moisture changes, te temperature and moisture changes. Um, species likes to get cool. Um, area and is completely restricted to the cold environment, usually north facing slopes at high elevations. Um, its hydrological niche um, is that it prefers a, mo prefers a moist habitat. Um, it, is, it is dependent on a localized moisture regime. So areas within that range um, may experience drying, um, subsequently a decreased habitat quality and perhaps quantity. Voiceover, I'm currently out of town, so thank you, Sam and Rachaza, very much. So the Ocumbagre fritillary, after being studied, um, was found to be threatened, and in 1991 it was listed as an endangered species because of its small geographic range, the declining population due to takings by collectors, adverse climate conditions affecting these animals, um, there really was a total lack of protective regulations on these insects. Um, very small population size like we discussed and low genetic variation, which would potentially lead to problems down the road. And as well, increasing pressure from sheep and humans. So in 1991, it was listed as endangered. A recovery plan was published in 1994. And it wasn't until about 2007 that a five-year review process um, Sought new information on the Ocumbagre fillari, looking at the status of them, where they were, and maybe what their future populations were going to look like. In 2009, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service published the final five year review, which suggested downlisting the Ocumbagre fillari from endangered, which it was in 1991, to threatened. Um, during that time, they had gone from 2 to 11 confirmed colonies. Um, and it seemed like a lot of the threats that had led to them being endangered, such, a, such as um, grazing from sheep, trampling of habitat, or collecting by people, seem to have been taken care of. They seem to have a fairly stable population for the 10 years prior. And the habitat that they were found in was found to be adequate. So, due to all of those things, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife suggested a downgrading. In terms of what needs to be done to protect future populations of Ocumbagre fritillary, uh, there are a number of things that we found through our research, as well as speaking with Kevin Alexander and researching the issue. 
Um, one, there just clearly needs to be more information on this population. Um, Kevin has been doing a great job at looking at their populations in 11 distinct colonies and looking at their life cycle, the length of it, how changing temperatures are affecting the length of their cycles, and as well as looking at overall population numbers. Um, but this research needs to continue going on. We need yearly population monitoring and annual population estimates for the future. Um, so future science is necessary as well. A lot of these populations are in areas that are heavily recreated. Um, and specifically, there is a Nkumbabre Plateau. So being able to manage recreation, whether by relocating trails so it doesn't go through sensitive habitat, or putting up signage that informs recreation lists about what's going on in that area. As well, um, the collection of butterflies, especially of these sensitive species, needs to be stopped. Uh, to a large extent, this has been very successful with the Nupagre Fulari, and a lot of it has been through educational programs, interpretive signs, and distribution of literature. Specifically, though, the interpretive signs around sensitive, sensitive habitats has been fairly successful. And finally, one of the larger issues was this idea of sheep grazing and the idea of sheep impacting the very small sensitive habitat that the Ucapagre Fidulari live in. And through stricter regulations of sheep grazing, this issue has also been addressed, but needs to continue to be addressed. <laughs> so, lessons learned according to Dr. Ian Malcolm. The impacts of climate change on ecology are not obvious. We see this all the time in a rapidly changing world where habitats are being lost before they're even truly discovered. Um, potential uses and... are not obvious. We see this all the time in a rapidly changing world where habitats are being lost before they're even truly discovered. Um, potential uses and more importantly specific populations impacts and roles in ecosystems is not fully understood and at this rate we're losing populations of insects, animals, and plants faster than we can understand their potential role in the future of certain ecosystems, and that's clearly been and will continue to be a very major problem. As well, um, insect conservation is just not a primary concern all the time. We tend to be more focused on the large-scale things like rising sea levels and disappearing megafauna that we forget about the little insects whose roles, even though they may seem very small or truly significant in the big picture. The next issue and lesson learned is rather interesting. Uh, with success and a stabilization of po uh, populations, downlisting is a possibility. However, the question remains, is conserve enough, a good enough long-term solution? In other words, what is that baseline that we are going back towards? Are we going back to the baseline when we first discovered? this species and trying to get them back to that population? Or are we going for historic populations or historic baselines in our climate change adaptation and mitigation efforts? Yeah. 
just uh, the population on top of uh, on the Padre, is it just a meta population? Have they observed other populations on the arrived on us? Or is it very strictly limited to uh, Uncle Padre? It was discovered on Mount Uncle Padre, but it's been 11 different populations. Okay, and so and I'm, Alexander, do you look at just the ones on Uncle Padre? Because that's part of what we see about when talking about it, or are they all over? Okay. It, so his the um, research that we um, interviewed him on looked at um, two sites um, of the eleven, okay. one of which is on the the, the two are disclosed. The other nine are confidential because of our collectors. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I remember finding that on the like seven years ago, and there were signs of diverting you around the areas or people have that. That's not a question, I guess. That's <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, 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 great. that's germane. <laughs> that's that's right. no, I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> we do there has been a lot of success um, in signage. Um, and so um, the five year review um, just talks about how we you know we can use more um, awareness as a form of coverage. Let's well, do one more and then we'll break. Uh, what would your strategy be to get people to start to care about these, you know, insect species on on scale rather than how do you approach that question? I think the problem is just focusing on individual species, um, especially when you are trying to push it through. Um, when it comes to how, like a utility standpoint, like how are these species useful? How is the Gunnison sagegrass useful to the valley, other than being a symbol and keystone species? Like what does it contribute to ecosystem services? And I think instead of even just focusing on a butterfly, you want to focus on the entire ecosystem, like the entire food web and what it does. So, for instance, we were talking um, about river systems and macroinvertebrates in river systems. And what would happen if the water became uninhabitable for stonefly larvae or uh, mayfly larvae? It would affect the trout populations. And then if you affect the trout populations, it would affect uh, the salmon, it would affect all animals that consume trout or ones that also would consume macroinvertebrates and ultimately like disassemble an entire <coughs> So I think the problem is focusing on one species and trying to push the polar bear through Congress, essentially. So. And Andres does talk about those gaps, and I think the gap, one huge gap is the trophic cascade of, of you know, a species, or insect species in its um, It makes me think of that Naomi Klein uh, podcast where she was talking about population collapses and vulnerabilities as due to stress and that effect, how it affects for, um, say fertility. Uh, fertility. <laughs> um, and I think that's also really interesting because you also have to look at the forces that you might not think about. Not just you know trampling butterflies or making the water acidic, but also the amount of stress that infrastructure and climate could put on uh, fruits.